So over the past few weeks, we've been um, discussing the essentials of Christianity. And so this week will be no different. Um, I will pick up where Pastor Raul left off. Um, Today, I'm sharing about Jesus as judge. And so I don't know if you guys know this, but there's an easy way to preach a topical sermon, and then there's the much more difficult way to do it. The easy way is you just do a Google search and you look for a scripture passage that, that <laughs> represents what you want to say. That's the easy way. It doesn't make it the right way. The much more difficult way is to look at the entirety of scripture in context and look at those passages that mention your topic within the context that it was written and within the context of the book that it's in and the space that it's in, and then try to put all of that together into a thought. Um, And so that was my task this week when I look at Jesus as judge. This, it's much more difficult to do a topical sermon correctly than it is to do just your normal expositional preaching. It really is, because now you have to look at multiple instances, and you really have to draw out the context. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're doing eisegesis, which means you're reading into the Scripture, instead of exegesis, which means pulling out of the Scripture, right? And we don't want to read ourselves into the Scripture. We want to see what God says. So, Bear with me. We will be doing a lot of reading of Scripture today, and it may be tough. And afterwards, we're going to want like lunch or something. But anyways, so I'm going to start with this. I'm going to start with the creedal statement that we're kind of working through. Mark, if you could bring that up. That's weird. It's there, but not there. Okay. Okay. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. In one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So, I was not going to read that whole thing, but then I was like, okay, so if, if our goal here is to kind of look at these statements, these essentials of what we believe, and I just pull this little part out that says, it says, from thence he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead. And that's all I gave you guys. I gave you absolutely no context, which would be absolutely the contrary to what I just said about looking at things in context. So I gave you full context which was still a lot to read. But anyways, moving on. Easton's Bible Dictionary refers to the final judgment as the sentence that will be passed on our actions at the last day. The judge is Jesus Christ as mediator. All judgment is committed to him. It pertains to him as mediator to complete and publicly manifest the salvation of of his people and overthrow of his enemies, together with the glorious righteousness of his work in both respects. That is the Bible dictionary definition of judgment, especially specifically the final judgment. 
The passage that I'm going to center around today, and I will be visiting a bunch of other ones, but the one that, that drew me in the most is John chapter 5, verses 19 through 30. And the reason that it drew me in, because not only does it show scripturally that, that Jesus is the judge and he will judge, but it also shows why. And then, and, and then later we'll be talking about what's that even mean for us, right? So John 5, 19 through 30. Jesus said to them, I tell you, the son can, only do, can do nothing on his own, but only what, the fa- what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. The father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be astonished. Indeed, just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whomever he wishes. The father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son, so that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Anyone who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son, and those who will hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of con- condemnation. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. God has ordained Jesus as judge over all, right? Father and Son are unified in honor because they are unified in the work that they do. God has given this judgment over Jesus. And I know, all right, when we think of judgment, what do we think of? Um, Here in the West, right? We automatically think of courtrooms, right? A judge presiding over this great procession in this courtroom, and what's that mean for us? Okay, Jesus is going to judge us. What's that mean? Well, that means that I must have done something wrong to be sitting in front of him, right? It's not necessarily what that means. In the past, when God bestowed the role of judge to others, it was limited. When Jesus is entrusted with all judgment, it is not limited in any way. There are so many passages in Scripture that refer to the judgment of the people of God. So many passages. I had this list that went on for pages and pages that I began my research with. And I was like, okay, yes, 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 okay, I could do this and I could just read passage after passage after passage to you guys this morning. I could. But I didn't know that that would be beneficial. I didn't know that that would make it personal. Because just hearing scripture passage after scripture passage without it being personal doesn't do us any good if we can't see ourselves in it in some way it comes in and then it just goes right back out we have to be able to relate to it that being said i am going to read some other passages to you (laughs) but i'm also going to try to help connect it in micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's temple shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, 
that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but his righteousness shall be the judge for the poor and decide the equity with equity for the oppressed of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. You know, one thing you can guarantee when you're up here is Pastor Raul always has a box of tissues. That is guaranteed. <sighs> Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in, ev- but in every people, anyone who fears him and practices righteousness is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus. He is Lord of all. That message spread through Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to justify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We have all these passages, long passages, All of them refer to Jesus as judge, and they all refer where Jesus claimed the right to be judge over all, right? God gave it to him. God anointed him as judge. But all in all, what do we need to know? What does this mean for us? Passage after passage, scripture after scripture, yes, Jesus is judge over all, and God made him that way. But what does that mean? How do we relate to it? What do we do? What do we need to know? Well, we need to know that Jesus is appointed judge over all and has been appointed that by the Father. And why do we need to know it? We must know this. Because no matter what we think or we believe, we will face judgment. It doesn't matter where you are, who you are, what you believe. We all will face judgment. It's guaranteed. It will happen. So what do we need to do? The answer to that is simple. We must yearn for God. So this is really cool because Wednesday night we got to talk about um, Psalm 23, the Psalm of David, and part of it was yearning for God. And we had some great discussion. 
And as I was looking over the passages and thinking about Jesus and judgment and what that means for us, this just pops into my head, which is great because it means that the Bible study that we're doing is actually kind of taking root in me, which is good. That's a good thing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, and if you guys are missing the study on Wednesday nights, you're missing out on some great conversations. Um, the youth are, are doing the same study, but they're doing it on Sunday mornings. If you prefer it in Spanish, they're also doing it here on Wednesday nights in Spanish. So if you're not in it, you're missing great conversations. But one of the things that we talked about was yearning for God. And this is um, out of the, the um, doctor. This is what Dr. Hicks said in our, in our study. To yearn is to long for or strongly desire for something. We should yearn or long for God's will over all our desires. The devil tries to get us to give our attention to something. Then he wants us to yearn for it. Whatever we yearn for ultimately defines our life. God wants us to yearn for him because he knows what will make us happy eternally. Many people may have biblical knowledge and a church background, but will, they will never be satisfied spiritually without yearning for God to be active in their lives. So, we will face judgment. But when we are yearning for God, when we are constantly seeking him, strongly desiring him, it changes our lives. It changes what we're doing. We're not getting distracted by all those things that would put us in conflict with God. What we're doing when we're yearning after him is our hearts and his become one. We're seeking God, and he knows what we need. He knows how we will be happy eternally. This yearning of God is how we come to judgment with no fear. All right. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a courtroom before, in front of a judge, and you are in trouble. <laughs> but it's not fun. <laughs> there is definitely some fear and some anxiety involved in that. But guess what? With Jesus as judge, that's good news. Especially when we are yearning after God because then we have nothing to fear. <sighs> so what do we need to do? We need to yearn for God. Why do we need to do it? Because redemption is available to all. And the other option is separation from God. When separated from God, chaos and emptiness will reign. Oh no, I did it, didn't I? I did the whole tohu bohu thing without even doing it. Look, you guys know that, that have been here for a while know that Pastor O loves tohu and bohu. He loves to use those. You can tell him I used it and it'll make him happy. I'll get points. <laughs> but it's true. When we are separated from God, when we are not yearning after him, that chaos and that emptiness will reign in our lives. And it will continue to reign throughout eternity if we choose not to seek him. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. I need you guys to grasp this. Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but he came to save us. 
Jesus came as judge. But guess what? He has already paid the penalty. So even though we will sit before him, or we will stand before him, or more likely we will fall on our faces and cry out before him, he's already paid the penalty. If we are to yearn for God, and our lives are to move in that direction, Jesus as judge is good news. It's not something that we need to approach with fear. Scripture reveals that David failed at times, and he needed to repent and begin again. But he never stopped desiring to be like his heavenly father and obey him. Because he never stopped yearning for God, he could write songs and poems about his experiences and share the goodness and mercy of God. David looked back on his life and said, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. David had experienced the inner torment that comes from the wages of sin, but also the gift of eternal life. David continued to yearn for God throughout his life. He realized the taste of godliness was far more alluring than any yearning that Satan might bring. David was the greatest king that the kingdom of Israel had ever known. God's anointed one, his chosen, and yet he failed at times absolutely failed, so much so that he realized that he needed to completely begin again. The example here is that when we fail, it's okay. We can begin again. Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Jesus is the ultimate judge that has already paid the penalty. When we mess up and we choose like David did to begin again and to seek after God and to yearn after God and to channel all of our strength and all of who we are into seeking God, it changes our posture with the world and with God. It changes who we are. It changes the dynamic of, of how we approach that day of judgment. Because guess what? I can approach it with joy and gladness because I have been chasing after God. I've been seeking Jesus, and now I stand before him. I kneel before him. And there's joy in it rather than fear. I told the, the worship team that I wasn't going to give them any code words or anything. So um, we'll just say code word. And, that, and, that, and that's time to come back up. <laughs> Pastor Raul said it's not fun if I don't use a code word. So code word is the code word. I've said code word. As we think about Jesus as judge and as we think about what that means for us. And as they play this final song, I want you to think about what you're yearning after. What are you chasing? What is the most important thing in your life? And I'll tell you what, where you spend the most time is the most important thing in your life. Jesus has paid the penalty. And I'll tell you, he wants you to come to that day of judgment with joy and gladness and not in fear. He has given us an opportunity for freedom if we would just seek it. 
Father God, I thank you and I praise you. I pray right now, Lord, that you would take all these jumbled words and that you would make something of it in our hearts, Father God. Father, I pray that you would help us to yearn for you. I pray that if today is a day that we need to begin again, that we would, that we would cry out to you and that we would start over just as David did and that you would just show us your grace and your mercy, Father. Guide us and lead us. Thank you for what you're doing. I pray this in Jesus' name. Here's what we're doing. The altars are open. If you are at a place where you need to begin again, let's utilize a physical act of moving forward in prayer and beginning again. Let us support you in that. Let us pray with you in that. Let us change what we're yearning for and approach the throne of grace, the judge that has already paid the price. 